So we will proceed in English. Is that OK? It will work. I uh, try to give you a little bit as we go along. I, I, I try not to speak too quickly, uh, but no promises. Must have a, another presentation. We'll, we'll, I promise we're going to do slides continuously. The entire thing will just be slides. Eventually, I have some of my vacation. Um, and and, and uh, we will pass out pillows and blankets in, a, in about an hour. Will that work for you? Yeah? All right. As I said, my name is Jason Tempestini. I'm the director of March Wars Training and Education Division. I'm going to be walking in this continuously. So if you can't see through me, yell at me. It works very well. Um, my job is to go around and preach the gospel of Marksware. I travel throughout the United States and now throughout Europe uh, talking about why Marksware products are such great products. Um, but also, I am the director of training, and I have a, a philosophy behind training, and that's that I need to give you information you can really use. So I promise this is not a commercial. Vio will handle that. Um, this, is a, uh, this is an informational session. And you will get information about how to utilize flight check. I'm not here just to sell it to you. If you want to buy it, I won't stop you. But I try to go one step at a time. Now, when I start these things, I always wonder why everybody here has come to listen to me. It's a, a, a fascination of mine. It doesn't occur to me that I, I would imagine none of you have read articles I've written, right? Has anybody re read an article by me? Seen me speak before? I have barely seen any chance of that since this is the first time I've been here. And I've written no articles. So, um, I always try to give a little background about who am I and what do I think I'm doing up here. I spent eight years doing free press, um, all of it electronic. I've taken three different uh, companies from manual free press to electronic. Um, I started out in the publishing industry because I'd lost my job doing electrical construction. So now I, I, I ended up in free press completely backwards. I spent the last three years as a free press consultant, uh, helping out small to medium and large printing companies to uh, actually make money doing this, which is a, a totally foreign concept to most people. So it gives you a little bit of background about me, and I'd like to know a little bit about you before we really get going. Um, how many people here own the company that they're representing? Owners? Good. Designers. How many people here are designers? Content creators? and they're all in the back of the room. That's good. I tend to pick on designers a little bit during the uh, course of the class. So uh, just be forewarned. I, uh, I've never been a designer. I'm sure I have some sort of uh, insecurity about it. But, uh, but I tend to pick on designers, they being the root of all evil. Um, uh, how many people here work for printing companies? Companies that actually put ink on paper. Just a few. And how many of you work for free press companies? Most of the rest of you. Now, now, some of you haven't raised your hands at all, or I didn't see it. I, uh, either A, you're in the wrong class, or B, um, you're shy. Shy is not recommended for this class. I, um, I, I really wanted to be a, a language teacher, an English teacher in high school. Uh, so I wanted to deal with teenagers every day of my life, and I ended up doing this instead. Um, but what happens is I, I like people to participate. I like people to be involved, to ask questions, to look like they're not asleep. Um, so being quiet is the surest way to get you picked on. I will start asking you questions specifically, and, and uh, I, I'm not mean, but I will we'll have a good time. I promise. It can be um, this can be a dull subject. Yeah. Do you agree? They're asleep already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got some studies like you ain't picking on me. <laughs> So it can be very dull just talking about computers and how they work, and I try to keep it a little light and have a little bit of fun with it. So what are we here to learn today? Well, we're going to build a unified workflow. We're going to WD-40. You have that, yeah? Um, we're going to build the unified workflow. We'll talk a lot about workflows and how the workflow can be put together to be profitable and, and productive. We're going to use flight check. What a surprise, right? Is there's only like 40 posters up around the place. There's balloons under here. Uh, I think each one of you has 25 pieces of literature about flight check. But believe it or not, we're actually going to use it during the course of this class. Um, and we'll pr really get fairly in-depth into it. And we're going to work on solving document problems. So not only am I going to show you how to scan a document, but also how to then fix the problems that you find. Does it sound like you're in the right class? 
Yeah? Yeah, this is this is what you what you came to, you know what I mean? This is pre-flight 101. Is everybody in the right place? Yeah, okay. All right, so how are we gonna get about doing this? Talk about the genesis of printing, growth and change, and the DTP revolution, just a little background on, on how we got here, how we ended up in this miserable industry. We'll talk about workflow management. We'll talk about pre-flight in the workflow. How workflow management is part one. Pre-flight in the workflow is, is how you actually integrate pre-flight into that. It goes on. Yes, I'm going to talk even more. But we'll do an overview of flight check. And then coffee pause it. Yeah? Close AA. Hey, hey, my, my nail liner is, is horrible. Absolutely horrible. Then we'll get into flight check in depth. Uh, the first time we do a little overview, we'll just uh, we'll peek at it, uh, give a quick rundown, and then we'll get in, in the in depth. And then we'll get into solving some pre flight problems, answer any questions you might have. Does this sound like a reasonable way to proceed? Yeah? Yeah? yeah we got some. Ah, ah, you don't nod, you just blink. Mm. It works, it works. No, 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 no. That, the front row, he's already like, I know it was a mistake sitting up here. Okay. So, the other thing is, I don't speak Nederland. Um, and that is my fault, and I wish I had learned before I came. Um, and I will learn before I come again, for certain. Uh, however, I, I only speak English, and I tend to talk. Wow, I put my hand, where was that? Right here, it gets really loud. Kills that gentleman right there. Um, I tend to talk quickly. Uh, I'll try to keep it fairly slow, but if there is something that I say in English that doesn't make sense, put your hand up. Ask, please. Uh, throw something at Vio and he will translate. Throw something at me and I will slow down. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah? All right. Let's do it. Voila. Who knows who Gutenberg is? Genesis of printing. Does anybody know who Gutenberg is? Johann Gutenberg? Yeah, he invented the press for all intents and purposes. He didn't really, it's technically not right, but in 1440, Johann Gutenberg looked at a bunch of other people's really good ideas and put them all together and made a press. And it wasn't the first time printing was around, but it was the first time that he made it practical. Um, so this is the, the first, uh, the beginning of printing. The next major innovation was in 1880, 440 years later. Mergenthaler created the line of type machine, whereby you could use a keyboard and produce a line of type. Um, how many people have been in the industry long enough to have seen cold type? To have seen actual uh, lead type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few. A few. More, more, than, more than most. Um, how many people have been in the industry to remember before computers? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, to, to have worked before there were computers really heavily used. Before before the Macintosh. Okay. All right, well, we got a few people, we got a few people. No, you have to understand, I, uh, I, I work with uh, designers a lot in the, in the U.S. And design school graduates are an amazing thing in the U.S. Do you have uh, design schools in Holland where you go to learn to be a designer? Yeah? Um, in uh, the U.S., when you get out of design school, uh, apparently you know how to sketch. Uh, but uh, the students that I talk to do not know uh, what an offset press is. They've never seen an image center. They don't know the difference between CMYK and RGB. They don't know what a Pantone color is. It's uh, frightening. So I need to ask, I need to find out where people are to, to determine just how much explanation I need to have. But there's not very many designers, so we should be able to move along pretty quickly. All right, so 400 years before we have the next major innovation, the nice thing that came along was offset. You know, everybody knows what offset printing is. Yeah, it's the, it's the modern method of printing, or as modern as it gets. 1890, or in the 1890s, this process was invented. 1960, before it was widely used. Who knows why? It's a great method. It's faster, it's easier, it's cheaper. Why? Somebody's got to talk to me. <coughs> To some extent, but the materials became more and more available. Yeah, certainly in, in 1895, it was tough to find a, a litho plate. 
uh, but the materials became more and more available. The, the basic reason is a pretty simple one. Growth and change. Just think about it. 400 years between Gutenberg and Mergenthaler, the, the two really big things that happened. 70 years to accept offset printing. Why? This industry is slow to change. Do you agree with that? Those of you who work for companies especially that have been in the printing industry for a while, you need a new piece of software, $200, right? So you write a purchase form. And sometime a year, a year and a half later, you hear back from them that they want to know more about the software before they'll, they'll talk about buying it for you, yeah? It's a, an industry that people don't like change. And then, of course, the nightmare happened. No, 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 I'm sorry. Getting myself one step ahead of, ahead of me. This is the what happened, what we were looking at. If you were working in the industry in 1970, this is about what you were looking at. How many of you can't read this at all? Hey, I got two people in the back. Can you read it just fine? No, nope, not at all. It's very simple. If you open up your guys, and you turn to page three, voila. Makes it a little bit easier. Also, there's space to take notes in your guide, um, and I follow along with it yeah, fairly well. There's stuff in the guide that I don't talk about, and, and there's things I talk about that aren't in the guide, but we keep pretty close. Think about how this workflow worked. You'll have to, some of you have never even seen something that took this long. We started with a customer, always start with a customer. I, I've always felt the, the printing industry would be a, a much nicer place to work if we didn't have to deal with the customers at all. Yeah. If you just design something and then you print it and it looks really good and maybe it you know, promotes your shop. You know, self-promotion pieces are good for that. But uh, unfortunately, there's a customer and they always have a budget. Uh, they always want it as fast as possible for no money. Um, and, and they want it to be perfect. Used to be worse. Now they do half of it themselves and it looks like garbage. So it's a little bit easier. But So you start with the customer and the designer would create a thumbnail, right? How long has it been since you've seen a thumbnail? You, you, you take and you make a little sketch. You put together a quick little sketch of what it's going to look like, and the customer bought the idea based on that. You know what I mean? You just, uh, we're going to have a picture here and some lines of text, and I think we'll use a font that looks something like this, and yada da. And they go, oh yeah, sounds like a good idea. So you get approval on that, and then you do, in the States we call it a comp. I don't know what you would call it. Uh, it's a, uh, your first draft of the piece. Uh, with hand-drawn lettering, and uh, you draw boxes for the pictures. It's like a thumbnail, but but much cleaner. You might color some of it with with uh, with uh, Pantone pens or or process color pens. Um, but I don't know what the word would be. But in 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 the U.S. we call it a comp. It's another, it's another sort of proof, and the and the customer would approve that proof as well. Was that? Yeah, it's like a presentation piece. Yeah. So then you go into design production. The customer picks which one of the three presentations they like, and then you, you set up copywriting, and you set up photography, and you set up typesetting, yeah? And you produce, uh, you get all the raw materials produced, illustrations as well, all hand done. And from all that, you produce a mechanical or an artboard uh, where you take the, you take the, the type and you, and you paste it all down to a board. And you take the you take uh, like a Xerox of the uh, of the photographs and you paste that down to scale and write FPO on it and I mean you go through the whole process so that you get an artboard that can be shot with overlays indicate the colors on the overlays. When was the last time anybody in here saw an artboard? Yeah uh, yeah yeah yeah. Before my children were born, you know. <laughs> so you get approval on the mechanical too, and then you go into film production. And in film production, you get a camera operator that shoots the board. You get another camera operator that shoots halftones. You send the color out to an entirely different company. And they produce color separations, four pieces of film and a proof. And the customer hates them, so they do them again. And the customer still hates them, so they do them one last time. Send it on to film assembly. And you get a stripper who puts the whole thing together. Perhaps a, 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 a film assembly technician would be a more uh, appropriate wording for that, but it, we, we always called them strippers in the States, which was fun the first time I became a stripper, calling my mother and saying, Mom, I'm a stripper. She was, she was unimpressed. Um, so you, put, you assemble the whole film. You assemble it in several different flats, and then you proof it, 
and the customer hates the entire concept. So you begin over here again, and you go through the whole process, right? Um, but eventually, you book the entire thing together, and you make a plate, and you put it on the press. You remember when production ran this way? A brochure from here to here would be a month in the entire production time. But there were some big benefits of this, of this way of working. You had a very skilled workforce. Typesetters set type. Color separators scanned color pictures. <coughs> Camera operators, excuse me, just shot um, boards or half tones. So you had people that knew their own industry very, very well, and as a general rule, had been in it a long time. Standards for production. Uh, we've been doing the same thing for 50 years. Everybody knew how, how it had to be done. There was, a, there was a set way of putting it together. And you had a high level of responsibility. I, I think one of the biggest things that, that we had then was that people really took pride in their work. It was a, a craft, not a job. Everybody involved in it was an artisan. Um, it's tough to be an artist with an image setter. You know, there's only so much you, you can punch that button in only so subtle of a way, you know? Drawbacks of the classic workflow. Slow. Probably the biggest thing. Now, it's amazing. We're now 100 times faster. We can, we can put out printed materials 100 times faster than we used to be able to. But somehow, in that process, there's no profit left in the industry. I'm not sure what happened. We're doing more work in less time for no money. It's an amazing industry. Um, long correction cycle. Probably one of the biggest problems. Because who has caught an error on press before? Ever found an error in a job, a problem with a job, on press? Yeah? You? Yeah? A couple of times? Yeah? Yeah, where all of a sudden you're looking at it. For some reason, it's always in 36-point type. There's a typo. You know, something's misspelled. Yes. You know, preferably the boss's name, right in the middle of the, the main headline. You know what I mean? And, ah! You know what I mean? And you stop the press, and then you go all the way back. And it's never in black type, is it? It's always in colored type. It was a, a process built with some sort of weird cutout. So you've got to go all the way back. You get the typesetter to set a new set line of type, and then you, then you shoot it, and you strip it in, and you, you make your builds, and you make your proof, and put it back on press. Uh, I worked for a, a printer in, in uh, the, the Midwest of the United States, uh, and these people had a, a, a taxi meter on their press. A very old taxi meter, so when a designer stops the press, they turn over the taxi meter. <laughs> and back away from it, it racks up money very, very quickly. Many go. Um, so it, it, they say it's, it's very good at motivating designers to finish press checks quickly. Because there's a, there's a certain point, there's a little sign on it that says when it reaches this point, we're going to start charging you money. So it works fairly well. Also, we had a limitation of capabilities. Yeah, kind of. I mean, we can do a lot more with computers than we can do manually. I mean, there's things that uh, all you have to do is think about a, a gradient screen. Does everybody know what a gradient screen is? Who doesn't know what a gradient screen is? Graduated screen, a, 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 a day for day? I, um, Hello? What's that? Fairlow? 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 Yeah. I have okay, to... it starts at 100% and goes down to zero or it starts at 30 and goes down to zero. Now, every piece you see has got some sort of gradient in it, and it always starts at you know, 25 and goes to zero. Anybody who designed before, before the Mac became popular knows what it used to be like. You would have to have a client that wanted to spend a lot of money, and, and then you would call up the service bureau and say, I want to put a, a, a Vectwell <laughs> in, in a, <laughs> I want to massacre your language on my phone. Um, I want to put, put a, a, a day for day in the piece. And they'd say, mm, OK. Do you want type on top of it? Yes, of course. What do you want it to look like? I want it to be in four color from 35% from, from to zero. You can have it in one color, 100 to zero. OK. You know what I mean? It was, you know, they were, they were a nightmare to do. Now it's what? Click, 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 and it's done. But for the most part, the things that we do now, you didn't, weren't even aware of being possibilities before, or they were so ridiculously expensive that people just didn't do them. 
So it was a lot simpler. You know what I mean? If you had a picture of two people and you really just wanted a picture of one, well, you had a picture of two people. You know what I mean? You, you, you know, you know the, the separation. People would say, well, then shoot the picture again. You know, because it, it, you know, or you can have us take a second person out, but it's going to cost you, oh, I don't know, about you know, twelve thousand gil. And anyway, what do you go? I would just have two people in the picture. You know what I mean? Now it's like, can't you do that on your computer? Can't you do that really quickly, really simply? It's a pain. We've gotten, gotten through is the DTV revolution. And this all started right here. All of you are familiar with, the, with the, the company Xerox, yeah? How many of you have heard of Park? You've heard of Park, Xerox Park? This is the Palo Alto Research Center. It's in California. And this was a, a pure research company. The people, the scientists who work here weren't expected to produce products. So when they invented things, Xerox ignored them. And they invented a couple of little things like Ethernet like the hard drive, like SCSI, like the mouse, like the modern monitor, you know, this bitmap display, they invented that. The laser printer, they invented that. Um, and the list goes on and on and on and on. The RIP, they invented that. So all this stuff was invented by Xerox, but uh, Xerox decided in their infinite wisdom that it wasn't marketable. Nobody would buy this stuff. So in frustration, the, uh, the uh, people who worked at, at, at Xerox left and, and, and did a couple of other little things. Um, for example, they, they started a little tiny unknown company called Adobe. I'm sure none of you have heard of that. These are uh, uh, John Warnock when, and Martin Newell who started Adobe were Xerox Park alums. Uh, they started little companies like Aldis. And it, it is tough for many people to remember Aldis now, but they produced this beast. How many of you really love PageMaker? Oh, good. We're getting along well then. Uh, not my favorite piece of software, but it was the first. And they went on to work for little tiny companies like Apple, making you know completely useless inventions like the laser writer. Um, this was the uh, I'd like to say the gunshot that started the revolution, but really it was the massacre that started the revolution. Um, nothing was the same after these three things came along. Uh, people who were in the industry before the DTP revolution uh, had had accounts like uh, doing newsletters for companies um, that just went away because suddenly these companies could do their own newsletters. And we all remember the amazing quality of those early corporate newsletters, don't you? You know what I mean? They would they would do it in uh, come off the laser printer. They'd do it in uh, Courier and like Monaco for the for the headlines. Uh, there was no such thing as kerning or, or, or tracking or any of that. They, they, they didn't even know about it. And they would print it on purple stock, black ink on purple stock, because they thought it looked cool. And I, I, I remember some hideous, hideous pieces of design. And the same customer that had spent a month on the last project arguing with you about how the K and the L looked next to each other were suddenly doing it themselves and couldn't care less. Because, you know, I typed it out, and hey, look at this, and it was cheap. So the DTP revolution started something. It started something sort of frightening. It got this entire thing in motion. Um, what, what, what it created was the modern workflow. Now you have a customer. You always still have the customer. It's unfortunate, but true. And now we go directly to design production. You don't do a thumbnail anymore. You don't do a card, a comp. You don't do a mechanical. You, it's, it's the next page. I'll get to the point. There you go. Um, you don't do any of that. You sit on your computer. You produce the entire concept. You take a digital camera, shoot a couple shots of the picture, right? Bob wants to sell some soup. OK, we'll put the soup down, take a couple shots of the picture, type up some text. All digital. Typesetting, what's that? I mean, designers that don't even know that the industry existed. You put the whole thing together. You put it all together in Corp Express if you're using your head in PageMaker if you're not. Um, you assemble the entire thing. You turn on your little Epson color printer, and you print out a comp. Let me show that to your customer. Is this what it's going to look like? Yeah, this is what it's going to look like. Great. Get it approved. Maybe you make a plate, and then you go to press. What used to take a month now takes a week. Now, it's not always done this way. 
there are still color separators. There are still people who shoot pictures on film, lots and lots of people, because digital cameras aren't that great yet. But you can see what's happened here. It's, it's gotten much shorter, yeah? Much simpler. Right, that's, that's the illusion. And there are a lot of benefits of this. Uh, it's fast, obviously. Uh, we have a quick turnaround cycle. Uh, you can make a mistake on press now. If you're going to a digital press, and, and the first sheet comes off, and there's, there's an error in the 36-point headline, you go, oh, well, hold on a second. And you turn around to the Mac, and you make that change, and you send it again, and it's coming off the press again. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a five minute fix, or maybe half an hour fix, as opposed to you know, a week long problem. And you do have enhanced capabilities. I can go over here, shoot a picture of the two of you, and completely take you out. And it's not even that hard. I think that's one of the problems with the industry right now is we didn't do good enough at keeping our secrets. You know what I mean? We should just let everybody believe that Photoshop is the most archaic, most difficult, impossible thing to learn. They should have made it very user unfriendly. Um, so that it'd be, you know, simpler for us to maintain our jobs. Uh, there are, of course, some drawbacks, too. Loss of skilled professionals. As opposed to a typesetter and a color separator and a stripper and a camera operator, we now have a designer. And this is nothing against designers, but designers are not trained to do all the things that all those professionals used to do. In addition, the designer is under as much more pressure as the pre-press operators and the printing companies are under, so they have to produce the same quality of work faster, um, so things get schlocked. They forget about kerning, oh, who cares about it? You know, it looks good enough. I'll kern the headlines. You know what I mean? And, 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 and things get dropped, and it, and it becomes, what happens is mistakes are made. Fairly straightforward. When the mistakes are made, we have communication problems. I often feel, and you know, it's, I guess it's more topical from here. No, I can't use that particular illusion. Um, Vito, help me out. Uh, tell me about a list a company that the Dutch like, a country. Rather, Belgium. Belgium. Belgium works. Okay, good. Um, it's, 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 it's like all designers are from Belgium. No, you speak the same language, though. Think, okay, so it's like all the designers are from French Belgium. And maybe I'm pushing it a bit there. Um, and all the pre press and printing people are from, are from Holland. There is just, you don't speak the same language at all. A designer looks at, it, looks at an image and says, it needs to have more life. It needs to be warmer and, and more full body. And the pre-press person looks at it and goes, oh, a little more magenta and take away a touch of cyan in the highlights. OK? You have to learn to translate design to production. So it's caused tremendous communication problems. It used to be simpler. There was a, there was a translator right at the beginning. The designer wrote detailed specifications of exactly what they wanted. And from that point on, all of it was in the production cycle. So by the time it got on press, you were dealing with somebody who probably ran a press two years ago. So uh, the communications were there. And this has really caused a huge problem. Also, there's been a lack of education and training. Um, how many of you graduated from design college? One, two, he's big, two. Um, I think design colleges aren't training designers to actually get the job done anymore at current. Um, I have met very, very few design college graduates, I mean, and I mean just directly out of school, that know how to do any sort of production. And certainly they don't know what it takes to create a document correctly. You know what I mean? It's, 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 there's a ton of problems. And this is really becoming more and more of an issue. Now, I think that's turning around, but I think it has been an issue. All right. What we've come up with out of this is the unified workflow. This is what I was talking about earlier. The unified workflow isn't, isn't something special. I'm not trying to, to create a grand new concept. This is just putting a word to something a lot of people have thought about. Make sense? Yeah? I'm just giving it a title. <coughs> Two things that, that I do with the unified workflow. When we see the unified workflow, it's the same thing, just as one additional step than the modern workflow. Just pre-flight. 
So the unified workflow combines the speed of the modern workflow and the skill standards and communication of the classic workflow. That was the other thing about working before the DTP re revolution, is you had to communicate. You couldn't do the whole job yourself. So you had to pass along all the specifications to the next person so that they understood where it was going. And it was also very, very obvious. Okay? Uh, can all of you at least picture an artboard? Who has never even seen one? Okay, everybody's at least seen one. That's good. So you can picture an artboard, and it's got overlays, right? And it's got the colors marked. And, it, and if somebody is, has taken the uh, has taken a, a moment and you know they they glued down the, the the type and it's at a weird angle, there's 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 only one of two solutions: either they're a horrible designer, which happens every now and then, or they made a mistake. And it's right there and easy to see. It's like a uh, Bill. Did, did you notice that the headline's about 15 degrees off center? You know, it's going up at an angle like that. And you didn't intend that. Okay, well, I can straighten it up. Pretty basic. Now, this is what you get today, right? Actually, a little bit bigger version of it. And it doesn't matter what you do to this thing. If you, no matter how you look at it, yeah, you can peel it apart. You can poke it, hold it up to the light, put it down on the light table. No matter how you analyze this thing, you can't tell what's here. On this particular one, there's nothing here anymore, but you know, you can't tell what's here until you put it in the machine. And the machine isn't necessarily going to tell you either. So there's been a slight increase in problems. We have the critical pre-flight stuff in the unified workflow. How many of you do some form of pre-flight today? Yeah? A few of you? A little over half? Yeah? You have to do something or else you just waste money. It's, a, it's an amazing procedure. So how do we create a unified workflow? And I'll talk briefly about creating a way of working so that you can make money at what you do, and so that you can make it a little easier to work with. All right. The first thing you have to do is manage the process. How many of you keep active track of every step that's done in every job inside of your shop, or asked to keep active track of it, had to fill out forms, things like that. One of you? That's not unusual. I mean, I'm not, most people don't do this. So you have to do that. You have to integrate or create a workflow written down on paper. Here's how it works. OK? You have to implement it, which means now that you've created this thing, you actually have to tell other people about it and make them do it. So we talk about managing the process. A process is a detailed workflow layout of all the paths that a job can take from the front door to the back door. Does that make sense? Yeah? Who here works for just a pre press company? You do? Hmm. I'll borrow you from me. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, I don't want to embarrass you too much. Okay. So so stand over there so you so you, so you don't cut Frank out of this. Um, and and uh, what I want you to do is you get a job in, right? Comes in the front door. What's the first thing that happens to it? You read it. You read it, so you, so you uh, pre-flight, essentially, right? What's the next thing you do? Design. Oh, so this isn't pre-flight. This is just review of the job, right? You, you, read the, the, you read the description of the job, right? And then you design, and then, and then what's next? Proof. Proof it. Mm. And after that? Get approval. Approval, and then talking faster than I am. Film. And that pen is a waste. Oh, sorry about that. I got a little hook on that. I, you know, I told you, you got to participate more. OK? Go for your paycheck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so after film? To the, to the printer? That's a workflow. Boom. It's that easy. But each one of these things has steps that you're supposed to take, right? And when you prove it, please, yellow, then magenta, then cyan, then black. And it should take X amount of materials and X amount of time, and these are the people that do that, and this is the person who's in charge of them. 
So you get the idea what I mean by putting the whole thing together. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, uh, <clears throat> see, when you start putting it together, you can get some advantages. You provide control over the process. You get bottlenecks identified and removed. How many of you have thought that you knew what was slowing production down and fixed it, and production was still slow? Have you done this before? You know, shooting the wrong employee? You know what I mean? And, oh, wasn't them. OK, next. You know what I mean? Enhances <laughs> productivity, and thereby profitability. No matter what you determine, write it down and stick with it. When you first develop a workflow that says, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, there are people in your organization that are not going to like that. They've been doing it a different way forever, and they know better than you do, right? They always do. Um, and they're going to do it their way. No, you need to, you need to kind of hang with it. Workflow analysis is not an overnight process. When you try to put this thing together, it's probably going to take you two months just to come up with the correct version of that. Okay? Implementing a workflow takes work. This is going to take a chunk of your time. If you're the manager of your department, then, then this is technically what you're supposed to be doing. But whether the owner lets you do that or not is, is a different issue entirely. Yeah? The workflow will change. This is the part I hate. You see, you spend two months, and you develop a, a plan for exactly how the workflow should work. And you, you walk it all through, and then you put it into production, and it doesn't work. So you have to change it to make it work. But this is like shooting your child. Is you spent two months on this. It's beautiful. It's perfect. How can you dare say that I need to change a little piece of this? You know, you have to, you have to, you have to let it go. So take a look at the work you do. Think strategically. Don't think about what you have to do 20 minutes from now, which is what we all do all day long. You know what I mean? What you, what you think about at 11 in the morning is what's due at noon, and what you think about at four in the afternoon is what's due at five. Yeah. Pretty typical. What I'm asking you to do is, in thinking strategically is to think beyond today, think beyond this month. Start thinking about things that will make you money in the long term. Utilize job tracking forms. We'll get into this a little bit. But yes, this means, as tedious as it sounds, that you need to write down 21, 22, proofing began. 21, 43. Proofing ended. Okay? You need the data. You need to know how long things are taking. Otherwise, what's the point? You're never going to figure out what's working and what's not. Work with everyone in the shop. Don't assume that because somebody is not directly connected to production that they're not involved or they don't know what's supposed to happen. You can even talk to account managers. Okay? I know normally they are they are the spawn of Satan, but at any rate, you can talk to the salespeople and they may have some good ideas. It'd be a bloody miracle, but it could happen. And promote communication. Oh, apparently I hit that twice, and I just do that. There we go. Promote communication. Make sure you, you talk with everybody because communication is what this is all about. By the way, I, I do try to warn people. Um, I will on occasion say hell. Uh, I've been known once or twice to say shit, and even rarely damn. Is this going to offend anybody? No? No? It's really OK to say yes? A bit? No? Oh, OK, good. I saw somebody put their hand up in the back, and they were just congratulating me. It wasn't OK. Good. Um, I just like to warn people before I really go off on one of my frenzies. All right. The first thing you have to do when you launch a workflow is set up a test period. Here's the workflow I have created. We're going to use it exactly as it looks for a month. Everybody's going to go, no, we don't want to do this. Because what's going to happen is it's not that there's problems with the workflow in the beginning. It's just that people are refusing to do it. They don't want to work that way. So you can't just let it change every five minutes on people's whims. You need to set up a test period and really run with it. Train everybody. You have a janitor, you have an owner, everybody in between. Boom. Needs to be trained 
how to what what the workflow is all about. That way, everybody understands. Even if they don't work in your department, they get a clue as to how your department works. Because trust me, if they don't work in free press, they think you're all a bunch of geeks staring at computer screens eight hours a day, not making any money, and wasting everybody's time. Yeah, you felt like people thought this way about you before. It's true. We do. Um, watch for rework. This is classic, and I don't know, uh, there, there's probably a better way of saying rework, but let me tell you what I mean. Somebody runs out five feet of film, four feet of them, uh, three meters of film and two meters are bad, okay, because of a mistake they make. What do they do? Do they, do they bring you the three meters of film and say, I've wasted two meters of film? And I'm sorry, no, 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 no. They cut off the two meters of film, they wrap it up really tight, and they stuff it in the bottom with a film barrel, okay? That's what you kind of have to watch out for, because you're going to be keeping track of waste, and you're going to be keeping track of rework, how much time it took to get a job done, why it took that much time. And people aren't intentionally trying to be dishonest. They just don't like to tell people that they screwed up. OK? So you got to kind of keep your eyes open. I've even had to go so far as I've had to lean on the film processor all day one day. Just kind of you know, got myself a coffee and just relaxed right there. You know what I mean? Watch film. Wow. Well, we've had that same page like six times now. Is, is there a problem? People really hate me when I come in and set these things up. <laughs> Provide incentives. Incentives are a very simple thing, yeah? You pull out this, and you say, OK, you make your goal 25 field. Or you make your goal, and I buy lunch for the whole company. Whatever it takes, whatever will you think will motivate people, but money seems to be pretty universal. Motivates most folks. Okay? So this is this is the deal. You have to give them some reason to do it. Because otherwise they will revolt and they will hate your guts. They have to at least be able to see something where where they get something when it's done. Implementing it. After you test it, and after you revise your sacred child and turn it into something you never intended it to be, but it apparently works, you got to do it. Continue with the incentives. I don't know if it works this way in Holland. It works this way in the US quite a bit. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to keep people's income, what they make, based on what you're trying to get better. Let's say your waste percentage, the amount of film you waste, is 40%. And your goal this year is to get it down to 15. Well, that's very simple. Vio, the production manager, you are going to make an extra 10,000 gil this year as a bonus if you hit 15%. Vio is very motivated. Yeah? Yeah? Finally, he can buy the ring for his girlfriend that he won't marry. Yeah? So he gets, the, he gets, that, he gets that motivation going. Stick with it. This is important. How many of you would have started out on Monday with a grand concept like this, and by Friday you were just doing what you've always done? Yeah? I've done it. Who else has done this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You get tired of it, and it gets to be a big pain in the butt, yeah? So you just, the heck with it. Nah, stick with it. You can really make a difference, and you can reduce stress, and you can make your life a little easier. Wild thought. Make sense? So why manage? The 10 to 20 minutes spent managing your workflow each day will offset two to four hours of lost time. How many of you get to go home at five every night, no matter what? How many of you ever go home at five? <laughs> I don't either, you know? Five o'clock is when the crisis begins. And, and it's an amazing thing. Nobody calls at 10 in the morning with a crisis, ever. If you pick up the phone at 10 in the morning, it's, 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 some, it's a friend asking if you want to go out that night. It's not a customer for certain. They're not awake yet, OK? It's always at, at, at 4.55 when you finally have the day. It's like, everything's done. Oh, very quietly, and, and then the phone rings. And you know, you know the phone makes that special sound when it's going to ruin your night, right? And you pick it up, and, and that's when the crisis begins. Management helps. 
Okay. Let's talk about pre-flight lore. Well, hey, he's getting around to what we came here to see. Yeah! <laughs> Makes you very happy. The pre-flight step provides quality assurance. Yeah? Pretty straightforward. Small investment in time and money reaps a huge reward in savings. Okay? And it's the key to the unified workflow. To make the unified workflow work, you have to do this. See, pre-flight's the process of analyzing digital art files to ensure they're ready to go to output. This is the best definition I've got. Does this make sense? Because this is, I was told you have the word jargon, jargon, professional language, yeah? And this is very jargon. There's a lot of jargon here. So I need to make sure that my jargon makes sense for your jargon, yeah? I, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. Please do not ask me to pronounce a J in the line, okay? I, I, everybody knows the name of this street, right? Grace Weiss, could they? I, uh, how many J's are there in that bloody word? What is it with the Dutch and their J's? It's an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing you guys use lots. And they're unpronounceable, at least for us poor stupid Americans. All right. So why pre-flight? Well, let's think about, first let's think about why we started pre-flighting. I just remember the first time we worked with an image setter. Yeah? Probably something by line of type. And it was, uh, We use a process to, to get film out that I call print and pray. How many of you have done the print and pray process before? You put out seven meters of film, and you put it down on the light table, and you, and you roll it all up, and you throw it in the barrel. And you put out another seven meters of film, and you save one meter of film, and you roll the rest of it up, and you throw it in the barrel. And you put out six meters of, of, of film. Do you get any idea? So you print it again and again and again, and you pray that it's ready. From there, because we were wasting I, I have gone so far as to waste a roll of film. Monday morning, put in a brand new roll of film. By Monday at noon, the roll was gone, and I had no film I could use. The boss had a big smile on his face. Um, but you, you end up writing down all these stupid mistakes you've made, yeah? So that hopefully other people don't do them again. Now, the people who, who come after you, you don't tell them, here's a list of all the stupid mistakes I made. Don't make them, OK? You tell them, these are the rules for proper output, as I have learned through hard experience. You know, no, 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 no. These are the stupid mistakes I made. Please don't make them yourself, OK? So we call it a checklist. How many of you use a checklist? Most of us probably use some sort of checklist, yeah? And they're perfect, right? They catch every possible problem. And so long as you use the checklist, there's never an issue, and you never waste film. Nah. Doesn't work that way. So we came up with automated pre-flight. Um, there ended the commercial. Um, automated pre-flight with flight checking. With there's there are other examples in the market right now. None that work as well. Um, but there are other examples in the market right now as well. But an automated pre-flight program that takes it away from the checklist and checks a couple more things. We have found in our research one comprehensive checklist that handled everything. It's called the CREF. Has anybody ever seen the CREF? C-R-E-F. Cytex produced this thing. It's 33 pages long of all the things that you need to check to prepare a file for output. It's endless. And I talked to the person who had written it, and I mentioned the fact that there's some really glaring mistakes. Still, there's things that are missing from this list. And he said, yeah, because it was done by a committee, uh, we, uh, you know, a light form with six or more legs and no brain, we had to, uh, we had to uh, take out almost 20 pages of problems because we couldn't get people to agree that they were problems. So, I mean, to do it manually is just a nightmare. But you pre flight because it's the heart of the unified workflow. And you all want to set up a unified workflow so you can make some money doing this and go home and see those you love even if it's just the TV, okay? You can save time, you can save money. Right here in the unified workflow. You've gotta do it, you've gotta do it. And we'll talk about how it gets done as we get into actually doing it. Save time, 
I like this little chart. This was put together by a friend of mine, my name, Rick Palasek. Uh, he runs a pre-press shop in, the, in Southern California. He's always been an innovator. He said, if the customer does it, the customer handles pre-flight, it takes no time for you. But of course, that's a hopeless pipe dream, yeah? If you do pre-flight, it takes you about half an hour. And it is. It's going to take you about half an hour. Every job that comes to the door, somebody's going to have to spend about 30 minutes looking it over. And when the job comes to the door that's a rush, everybody goes, no, no, we don't need to do that, right? I can't wait 30 minutes to get this on to the image center. But if you find the problem in film, it's going to take you an hour and a half to fix. And if you find it on the plate, it's going to take you two hours to fix. And if you find it on the press, it's going to take you four hours to fix. And that's if you're lucky. Right? And of course, there's never any errors in jobs that you decide need to go really quickly, right? Rush jobs are always perfect. True? If somebody comes in and they have a rush job, they've always taken really especially good care of it to make sure that it's going to run right? No. How about money? Again, it doesn't cost you anything if the customer does it, but of course they won't do it. Um, it's going to cost you about 25 bucks. If you include, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is all in the US. But it's going to cost you about, so 40 field to pre flight something. That's including paying for the person running the machine and buying the software and working it out and all that kind of stuff, the machine. But it's going to cost you 200 field on film and 1,000 field at the plate because plates are expensive. And you'd be lucky if it's just 2,000 field on press, right? How many people have, have not only shut a press down, but had to pull the job completely? Because it turned out to be a disaster. I've only had to do it once. It was very, very expensive. I shut down a web press, and I kept it shut down for six hours while I paid 2,000 guild an hour to have it sitting idle, and then I pulled the job and paid a pull fee and got it bumped three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oops. So, do you have any questions about what we've covered so far? Anything? Any of you still awake? Yeah? Nobody's even laughing at my jokes. It's a bad day for you. <laughs> okay. You get an idea of what I'm talking about here. What I'm, what I'm just trying to get some background and talk about... The, I, I, I can't lean my head over like this or I hurt these people very badly. Um, and talk a little bit about the steps you have to go through to get it done right. What I'm going to show you today in showing you flight check, I'm going to introduce you to a newfangled shuttle. Okay? That's all it is. It's just another tool. It's a very simple tool to learn. It's not terribly complex. I'm going to show you ways to use it that'll, that'll help you be really productive with it, but basically it's a pretty simple tool. And, and just a shuttle is pretty useless. Right? You need to know that you want to dig a ditch. So this is the ditch. Make sense? Maybe I used, I was stretching that metaphor pretty far. That was close to breaking point. Okay. And if it makes you feel any better, in just 45 more minutes, we can all take a break. All right. And I, I get to see, I get to stop anytime I want, drink water, do whatever I like. Get towards the end of the afternoon, I'll start smoking up here in the hole in yours. No, I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> Voila. Hey, it's all just not the way it was supposed to be. Now, normally, just a, just a, a way of warning. I, I have a special program that I run inside of my computer. And what I try to do is simulate a production environment as well as I can. So at some point during, this, during the course of showing you this, my machine will unceremoniously crash, somehow taking most of the data with it. This is just to try to simulate a production environment. And I see if I can make it happen as randomly as possible. Um, it's, 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 I also try to give a little background so you understand why it's running fast or why it's running slow. This is a PowerBook 3400. It's a very nice machine, but it's a 200 megahertz Macintosh laptop. I have a two gigabytes of hard drive available and 32 megabytes of RAM. Um, that's just, I'm not trying to be a tech weenie, I'm just trying to give you an idea of, of what this is running at. Um, because it's a PowerBook, although it's at 200 megahertz, it runs at about the same speed as a 6100. 
uh, a 601 chip uh, power Macintosh. So it's not super fast, but it gets the job done. Make sense? All right, everybody needs a stretch or something like that. We've gotten a job in. When a job comes in, it's going to come in with a job ticket. Now, I understand that you don't have this as a concept. But the, the word job ticket isn't what you would call it. What would you call this? Work order? Yeah, you know, you know, like a work order. OK. So this is the job ticket. This is the work order. Nah. Pretty straightforward customer information. Who in the hell are we doing this for? Media track. We got how many disks and how many images, and we returned how many disks and how many images. Because I always put this in here because, frankly, I lost a, uh, a, a stock image once. I lost a transparency for a, for a stock photograph. We never did find it. It cost the company $5,000 US to replace that transparency. They, they don't like that at all when you lose those. So this just gives you a, a quick little thing where you can, you can say, OK, we got this much, and we return this much. They may not match, but you know, job track. Remember I talked about, um, about having to track everything that you do? This is that. Job number. You know, most of you use some sort of job numbering system to keep track of things. It's a lot easier than, than Bill's job and the other Bill's job. And then, yeah, the other Bill's job, you know, the one that's really big. OK. When did it get here? By job arrival, I mean when did the account manager bring it in the front door? And we all know how that works, right? You ever seen an account manager bring one in? I, I think I've got one down here. Yeah. Not an account manager. Actually, I do have a couple of those back here, but they're nice ones. <laughs> I have to say that I work for one of them. Um, so this is a job, and the account manager brings it in, do something like that, and <laughs> back out the door, right? As quickly as possible. I, I don't think, in, 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 I think I'd spent four years in, in the industry before I saw the face of a salesperson. I, I knew exactly what kind of shirts they wore and what, what their backs looked like, but rarely a face. So the account manager is going to bring this in, and this is filled out, right? Um, or at least that's, that's the supposition, is that this is filled out. Uh, bottom half of it is also pretty straightforward. So just documents, images, fonts, notes. So it's you know exactly how you want to put this together. Most of you have some sort of job form. It's on page 11, by the way, in your book. I believe. Hey, I memorized it. It's on page 11. So you get the idea. This is how the job is supposed to come in. And you need to stop the sales pro. I, I call them sales professionals. Can I use that word? And you'll understand what I'm saying. Yeah. You need to stop the sales professional and make them talk to, the, to you about the job. This isn't a, a half hour, well, maybe you know, this, is, this is the Netherlands. Maybe it is half an hour over coffee. But, 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 but normally, it's just a five minute thing. You just sit down and say, really, they want this, and they want this to happen. And, and because that's when the, the sales professional will remember, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we need to, we need to do a, a clipping path, a clip on, on this image. I'm sorry, I forgot to write that down. And you, would, you know, you, and you wouldn't have remembered it until it came off the of press, right? So it gives you an opportunity to go over the entire job. It really doesn't take longer than five minutes, and it can save tremendous headaches. So you read over the job ticket, and you go over the thing, and then you put the entire thing onto the pre-flight system, right? Of course, you all use pre-flight systems, loaded, of course, with flight check. Um, I'll try to be a little more subtle about this, but not, I, I promise not much. Um, all right. And this is the job as it's come in. Okay? It's the basic bucket approach to, to job folders. They just took everything that was involved in the job and they tossed it off into this one bucket and hey, there we go. They at least put the fonts together in a fonts folder. Well, they mean that they provided them at all, which is amazing. That we have any of these five files is, is absolutely astounding. Um, and of course it is the dreaded. Can you see from all the way in the back that that is a page maker document? PageMaker 6 out of boot. Um, it could be worse. It could be PageMaker 4.2. I've gotten those fairly recently. So the first thing you want to do is you want to load the fonts. And you have to assume, and I know that's sort of frightening, but you do have to assume that they actually 
gave you the farms. And the simplest thing, I use ATM Deluxe. I'm, this is not an endorsement of ATM Deluxe. I just happen to like the program. Suitcase and ATM Deluxe, I think, both work very, very well. <coughs> Does anybody use anything else? At all? Yeah? Master Juggler? Much the same. I've never used Master Juggler, so I really don't know. So there's the font set, and you can just highlight it, activate the fonts. And it's going to tell us, oh, the font times is already open. Activated anyway. Yeah, what the heck? I'll open it twice. I know it's completely against the rules, but technically what you should do is have no other fonts active in your system at all. Uh, in a pre-planning system, inside the system folder, the fonts folder inside the systems folder, has the city named fonts only. Uh, Monaco, Geneva, not even, no, no times, no symbol, no Helvetica, no Zap King bats, get rid of all of that. In fact, if you can get away with it, only Geneva. Because Geneva is what draws this. And other than that, nothing in the system folder. The system folder is a horrible place to organize fonts. Um, Apple itself has finally admitted that it was never intended to handle more than 12 fonts. They have, they have publicly recommended no more than 256 fonts. But uh, how many of you have ever tried to put 50 fonts in there and still keep the machine running? It really, it really starts doing amazing things. You know, seven digit error codes, error number negative 1665349. And you call up Apple and they say, I, I don't know. Which is what happens if you call Apple and ask how to turn the thing on. But it gets even more radical here. All right, so we have to assume that the fonts are loaded. We're going to drag and drop this to the flight check demo. Now, this is a dem demonstration version, but it's the full working version again. Flight check analyzes the fonts. For those of you that have wondered, what in the world is it doing before it starts scanning and checks the fonts again? And then it scans the document. It scans for over 150 potential problems. Oh, then you've got one inch of scale. So that's all that's wrong with this job. Hey. How many of you how many of you have used flight check before? How many of you have seen a screen with just the one problem? <laughs> Nobody. I mean before you turned off all the ground controls. And just, just for a, a special treat here, we'll, we'll do one other thing. Because this is a sound I'm, I'm sure that many of you have never heard. Did you hear that? Did you know it could make that sound? <laughs> Had you ever seen this guy before? Without turning off all the ground controls. OK. The results window is the first thing that pops up. And the results window gives you an overview. So it's going to take a brief walk through the park with this. It gives you the categories where there could be potential problems. And in this case, of course, we have a perfect job and everything is green and lovely. In the bottom, normally, we show you specifics about each of the individual potential problems. Now, you'll find that in everything we write, and most of the time when we talk, we talk about, the, about everything that Flight Check finds as a potential problem. And this is very true. Image scaling, we consider to be a problem all the time because it's going to cause issues with the rip and with resolution and everything else. But if you have a 4 megabyte image, you know, a little 4 by 5 inch black and white, that's been scaled to 104%, do you care? No. You're just going to let it run. You know, you're not going to mess with getting in and changing the image and doing the whole nine yards. It's not worth it. It's not going to make that big of an impact. Not at 4% enlargement. Now, that's not technically accurate, but it works. And we have to work in a production environment. So that's why we call these potential problems. You can, excuse me, you can choose to ignore just about everything and still make the job work. A little bit of print and pray involved, but you know, there's got to be some sort of combination there. All right. The main window is divided up really into four major areas, OK? At the top, you have application and printer information. And this is the most ignorable portion of flight check there is. Okay, Most times when you're pre-flighting, you're not connected to the printer that you're going to output this on finally. You're not connected up to the RIP. So you, none of this makes a whole bunch of sense. Because it all needs to be, you, you have to alter all of that. 
you had to really mess around and hit the right TPD selected in the original document and the whole nine yards to set it up so that it was going out to film. So for the most part, you're going to ignore the print settings. And you know, indication number one that this is not a commercial. It's like, all right, so this part's useless and just leave it alone, okay? The application side is more important. You do have to make sure that you're running the same version of the application. With PageMaker, this is especially critical. How many of you have tried to open a PageMaker 4.2 document, for example, in any higher version? You ever tried to do this? Open PageMaker 4.2 in like 5.0 or 5.5 or 6.0? I, I called it the magic dance. Because you open it up and you'd see a two-page spread and you'd see all the type go. Mm -hmm. And then and then people are looking at me like, this guy's a psychopath. <laughs> Tearing apart discs and flinging things at people. And so it's text reflow. Because in every version of every application, they change a little bit just to make you mad how they handle the way text works. <coughs> they change the hyphenation plan just a little bit or they change the way it works. Now, Court took this into account when they gave you the option of keeping document settings or keeping Quark Express settings. For those of you that have always wondered what in the world do those two buttons make and why do they keep asking you, that's the whole deal. It's just so that the text won't reflow. So the version is important here. Colors, pretty straightforward. These are the colors used in the document. And you can get more information than you're looking at right now. Flightic is a database, basically. Does that make sense? What Flight Check does is it takes the original document and it reads the code. <coughs> There's no rip here. It doesn't, it doesn't process and rip the file. It reads the file, line by line, okay? And pulls all this information out and it puts it in a database. And then it applies a test to the database and says, okay, this information is, or is, is correct or incorrect. And at the most basic level, that, that's all it really does. So like a database, there's a variety of different information you can take a look at. You, we're looking at used colors right now, but we could look at all the colors. Or we could just look at problem colors. Well, I thought this job was perfect. So what's up with problem colors? Anybody have an idea? Blue, green, none, paper, red, registration, white? Non-printing colors. Unused colors. Okay. You still, flight check is good, all right? It really does what it's supposed to do, but you still have to do something, okay? Doesn't matter how nice of a car you buy, you can buy the world's best Mercedes-Benz, and you still have to turn the wheel. You might not have to shift anymore, but you still have to turn the wheel, okay? So you still have to at least be able to click around a little bit and know what you're looking for. Let's take a look at this. If it were three years ago and I had a bunch of unused colors, I would immediately be going into removing all these unused colors because it's going to give me, that's what you get 27 meters of film from, right? You have a bunch of, of, of lovely pieces of film with nice marks and an indication of what color it is and not a damn thing else. Okay? Blank. For the most part, I, at least in, in court, it's very easy to not print unused colors. And in PageMaker, PageMaker won't unless you tell it to. So it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward handling unused colors anymore. It's still a good idea to delete them, but you get the idea. So you can see a variety of different information on all these different areas. Problem fonts, and it's a good idea just right at the beginning to just go problem, problem, problem. And it turns out we really have no problem images or fonts, but we do have some problem colors and we can make that choice. Okay, can I trust the production guy? Is he actually going to turn off, include blank pages, and, and we'll be okay? Okay. When you first look at this application, does it look a little dominating? Do you kind of look at it and go, uh, a lot of stuff up there? Yeah? It's okay. Yeah, I did. First time I looked at it. You see, I lied my rear end off to get this job. I uh, was supposed to write training for them 
So I met them at the Seabold show in San Francisco. And this is just supposed to be a meeting. Just sit down and, yeah, yeah, we'll go over it. So you know a little bit about flight check? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know some stuff. I've, I've run flight check several times. I've never, you know, not even popped in a demo disc, nothing. Never seen it. I think I saw a demonstration once. Great, do you know Luminous Open? Do you, you guys have Luminous in Europe? Track-wise and press-wise and products like that, they're all made by a company called Luminous. Open is their workflow automation product. And that I knew. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Open really well. Great, can you work for us at the show? And suddenly, in five minutes, it went from being a meeting to I'm demonstrating flight check in the Luminous booth with Open. And to begin with, that whole little relationship barely works. So it's like the programmer's over there going, okay, okay, you can do this, this, and this, but don't dare touch this. And you can do this, this, and this, but don't go there. And you can do this, this, and this, but please, please, don't save anything. Okay? So that's how I learned flight check. You can pick it up pretty quickly, actually. The first column in colors is going to tell you what kind of color it is. Make sense? When it's talking about specific PMS colors, like cyan, magenta, yellow, or, or specific process colors, excuse me, it's going to show you that actual color block, either, either blue or red or yellow. Okay? If it's talking about a process mix, it's going to give a little process mix icon. You see all four of them coming together. And Spot colors come up as green. Now here, we have another problem, don't we? This is a process job. Anybody see a problem here? Can anybody see it? Fifth color. Pantone 1665. It needs to be converted to process. It's in Pantone. Oh, and what a surprise, it's in an image. Here's the other thing it tells you. There's a column there that indicates if it's in the document. Makes sense, right? Seems like everything would be in the document, but no. There's also a column that indicates if it's in an, uh, an EPSF file, a built-in, like an Illustrator image. OK? You can see here that we've got a color there. The Pantone is in an, an embedded file, but it's not in the document itself. And this is probably one of the biggest problems there is. Rest of this. Pretty straightforward. The model, CMYK, RG, you know, Pantone, RGB, whatever. The CMYK break of it, how it breaks off the CMYK, the angle that it's going to print, that it's going to plot on, and then a bunch of information about color usage. Now, this is really the set. You look at these, and you think, I'm never going to learn this application. I'm never going to figure out what all this means. And in fact, I'd rather just ignore it all. Even this is pretty simple. If you put your cursor over the top of the uh, over the top of the icon and you click and hold, you'll find an amazing thing. This column will display an icon if the color is being used in text stories, and you'll find that it's true of all of them. This column will display an icon if the color is being used in a text box fill. I always wish we had one of those really cool voices like you get in cars or something that goes along with the enemy. Click the button, boom. This column, sorry. So. It also breaks down into four fairly logical chunks. These four are fills. These four are frames or rules. And these four are tracking. OK? And the specifics, when you forget a specific, and I still forget a specific now and then when I'm in the middle of a demo, just click and hold. If you ever see, in fact, if you ever see the people in Marksware doing a demonstration, and they look like they're really trying to show you, oh, yeah, they really want to see this hot health thing. No, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. So they're reading the hot health very quickly uh, while explaining that, that, oh, yeah, yeah, you can see that we have uh, help on all these things. OK. Colors make sense. Information pulls up. And this is quick. We'll get much more in depth, trust me. Fonts. Same little set of icons over here. OK. The first icon tells you if the font's been loaded in the system. Okay. Second icon tells you if the screen font's available, then the printer font. Is it used in a document? Is it used in a graphic? By the way, anytime you see that little graphic icon, click on it. It'll give you a list of the graphics it's used in. Same is true down here. And apparently it's the same thing. Using the name of the font, the printer font file, and the style, the type, the version, the manufacturer. <coughs> Why do you need all this information? I mean, it gets worse. 
Okay. Why would anybody need all of this information? Any ideas? We need any? No. A fairly simple thing, really. All of this stuff is so that the dialog box doesn't look so small. Okay, we wanted to have a dialog box with some body, and we didn't want to, you know, just leave, you know, just a couple little things in there. But really, there's 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 three really salient pieces of information here. The name is critical. The family ID and the version. You notice this is contemplate Gothic bold BT version two. You think it looks anything like version one? A lot like the difference between version one and version two of the page maker, or a cork, or anything else. They look the same, but what, what you do when you, when you change versions on fonts is you change the kerning pairs. That's how you upgrade a font, is you give more kerning pairs. What happens if you use version two in a document that had version one in it? You get text reform throughout the entire thing. Flight check will, won't, Right now, it's saying the fonts are good, but it has the fonts. We could have six copies of copper plate loaded, um, and it would only say it was good if it found family ID 3418 version 2.0 of this exact spelling. Okay? This is the other reason that, you know, sometimes you, when you organize fonts, they take a font like Times, and you want to put it in a folder called Times. Always change the name of the folder. Don't ever change the name of the font. Just a little tip. Put a little, you know, times folder, call a folder, or something like that. I mean, it changes somehow because if you change the name of the font, you just screw up your font management for some time to come because it's based on the name. All right? But it, do, it does search by all those elements, which is why you need all the information. <coughs> Incidentally, if you think the character set's hard to read from where you are, it's unbelievably even harder to read on screen. So for filling space. It looks better, you have to admit. It makes a pleasant little graphic addition to the program. What's that? Yeah, well, yeah, you could, and then you'd have dialog box as big as the main one, you know, people would complain. In the images area, it tells you what kind of an image it is. Uh, was it created in Photoshop or Illustrator? Um, this is really tough to see at range. These are the, the icons of the career. Um, it also tells you if any fonts are used, and I, I keep talking down to that microphone and hurting people. And again, it's going to give you the list of fonts used. Incidentally, if you click on this icon, ah, come on, font for me. I don't know something. Oh yeah, it gives you. Sorry, just double one click. It gives you the list of colors used in, in the image. So to give you the name of the image, the page it's on, its status, size, as in file size. Um, is this too low for people? I wish I could raise it. I can't. Um, <laughs> Like, is this too low for people? Too bad. Um, but it gives you the file size. It's going to tell you what type of image it is, either TIFF or EPSF. How many of you are familiar with the term EPSF? Let me do this real quick because I'm going to use it a lot. We use two different terms, EPS and EPSF. Okay? EPS, we, by we mean bitmap by that, an image. EPSF, we mean vector, an illustrator or a freehand file. Yeah, make sense? OK. Because there is a, a, a slight difference between the two. Um, all right, the type, the mode, and then we're going to give you a resolution calculator. This tells us that originally this image was at 104 dpi, but it's been seen at 47%, so now it's at 221 dpi. Okay, so you have initial and effective resolution. Handy. And then again, a bunch of information about how the image is used. Is it on a fill of none? You know, if you place a tip in cork on a fill of none, it gets that jagged edge when you output it. Does it need a clipping path? This applies not only to tips on a fill of none, which need a clipping path if you want to use them that way. It also applies to, and I've done this 20 or 50 times, you, you take an EPS image and you make a clipping for it because you want it to be outlined. And then when you save it, you forget to select the clipping. Have you ever done this? In the Save As EPS dialog, you have a place where you have to select the path you want to use. 
I have forgotten it many, many times. I forget to select the right one. This will put off a warning to tell you that there was a path created for the image, but it hasn't been used. And that's a truly potential problem. Maybe they didn't want to use the path, but you might want to take a look at it. <clears throat> tells you if the image was framed. It'll tell you if it's got a hairline frame or a bitmap frame. It tells you if the image box has been rotated, skewed, or flipped horizontally or vertically. It tells you if the image itself has been rotated or skewed. And then finally, all, all of you know, the, really the best place to edit images is Corp Express, right? I mean, that is an image editing machine. It's got all those functions. You know, you can open up, uh, I don't think I have an image open in Corp Express right now, actually, but so you, if, you, if you select a, a TIFF image in Corp Express, you, know, you get that whole new style menu, and you can, you can change the contrast and do all sorts of fun things with the color. 